right, good morning, everybody. Today is Sunday. It's uh, March 28th, 29th, I guess, 29th. Kind of lose track of dates, don't we? Uh, like many of you, I had other plans for this weekend and find myself sitting at home and thinking about all the things that are going on. Uh, I've been doing a series of videos for the schools, uh, for Bellevue schools, and then on the weekends, I want to do some things that more directly involve the expression of faith as well as what's going on with our mental health. I'm fascinated by the intersection of mental health and faith as I find that both arenas seem to be talking about the same thing in maybe different ways, but I think that having a strong faith, a strong spiritual understanding of the world is almost essential in these difficult times. And so I want to kind of um, piggyback on what I talked about last week. And if you go to uh, the YouTube channel or look for the the playlist, The Illusion of Control, I, I spoke for a little bit about this issue of wanting to be in control and the realization that we really aren't in control. Uh, in fact, what we're really looking for is a world that is safe and predictable. We want a world where our decisions matter, where the things that we do yield outcomes that are, that are predictable and that we feel that we're in control of things. People who don't really have any interest in faith at all, uh, maybe in the mental health arena, will also say that the sense of control is essential to having uh, control, emotional control and behavioral control. In fact, everybody's looking for it. Having a world that is predictable, where the things that we do actually produce a result that's predictable, where even our mistakes are contained within boundaries. Um, this is why it's so important for children right now that they have uh, a predictable setting in which to work out all the anxiety and the stress of what we're dealing with, with right now. And that ends up being at the home. Now, some people are saying that means that you should get out a color-coded schedule and schedule every minute of the day. And that's not really it at all. That's not what we mean by having a predictable and safe environment. What we're really talking about is an environment where kids are able to make decisions in a safe way where they receive unconditional acceptance um, in the midst of a stressful situation where expectations are clearly defined, where there are expectations that need to be met, things like chores and, and doing some schoolwork or some reading. There's all kinds of things, but kids need this so, so, so important. We all want to be in control, but what happens when our circumstances are completely out of control? And, and that's a case that we're all experiencing right now with this COVID quarantine. We're all stuck at home. We don't exactly know when it's okay to go out and when it isn't. Uh, my wife was sharing something with me today about a, a concept called moral fatigue, and I certainly have heard about this before, but we're all going through a, a time when decisions that used to have really no moral implication at all now have profound moral implication. Like, should I go to the grocery store? Or should I not go to the grocery store? Should I go over even to talk to my neighbor? Do I um, uh, go to a park and take my kids to the park? Do I walk my dog? Like these are things that we should not have to worry about. But now all of a sudden they have a really strong moral component to them because we feel this pressure of not contributing to the crisis and not exposing the people we care about. Well, what happens is, as you know, when things get completely out of control, we have a tendency then to grasp at control that we do have. And so one of the examples that's somewhat humorous, although it can be troublesome in some cases, is this thing started breaking out, nobody could control it, and so we all ran to Walmart and bought all the toilet paper off the shelf. We all decided we needed to hoard supplies for ourselves because at least we could be in control of that. Now, people may not have perceived this as a control issue, but ultimately, when the world begins to careen out of control, we grasp at things that help us feel like we are in control. So why is this? Like, why are we like this as human beings? And this is where I want to intersect with, with faith, although if this isn't a story that you want to embrace, my, it's okay. I just want to bring into, uh, an, into the conversation an idea that comes directly out of the Bible, the, the, the book that we use as Christians to uh, be the inf information for our faith, the guide for our faith, the stories by which we 
understand the world. A lot of people find the Bible really confusing, and I want to take you to a place in the Bible that is especially troubling for a lot of people, and that's right to the very beginning, the very first chapter of the Bible in Genesis where it talks about God creating the world. And what I want to put forth is this idea that our faith, for those of us who are, are looking at faith, and, and if you are a person who follows Jesus and you're all about that, awesome. But if you're exploring faith right now, if these difficult circumstances are leading you to a place where you're like, I don't really know what to think about faith. I'm not sure really what to do with God. Like, is there a God? How could there be a God? And do the stories in the Bible help us to understand what's happening right now? I would just like you to consider the possibility that there are some really good explanations for why we are the way that we are. And one of those has to do with the issue of being in control. So one of the things I've come to recognize in, in working with people is that if we look for the image of God in people, and the Christian scriptures, the Jewish scriptures that we call the Old Testament, followed on by um, the New Testament, which tells the story of Jesus, Talk about people being created in the image of God. Now, being created in the image of God obviously doesn't mean what we look like because we don't all look like God. I mean, some of us uh, clearly look like God more than others. No, it's not about what you look like, but it's about the, the characteristics of God, the things about God that have been put into us that express the presence of God in us. And so... There are a number of things that people do that, that animals just don't do. Uh, one of those things is creativity. We have the ability to create. And, and in future weeks, I think I'll talk about this because I just think it's fascinating how creativity is one of the things that people do that is both the most amazing thing that we possibly can imagine and also gets us into all kinds of trouble because we end up creating bad circumstances for ourselves with our ability to choose. But within the story of the crea being created in the image of God is this uh, little nugget buried right in Genesis 1 that basically says we were created to be in control. We are supposed to be in control of the world. So I'll, I'll pull up my little Bible here. We'll, we'll just read from Genesis 1, chapters 27, or verses 27 and 28. Uh, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Pretty important to note that in this version of the creation, uh, men and women are created together and they are given the same directions. It's not that men and women are given different directions, they're given the same directions. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over every living creature that moves on the ground. Now, he goes on to talk about being given all the plants to eat, like, People were given authority over the earth. Now, some people will say, well, we shouldn't rule over the earth. We're just a part of creation like anybody else. Well, I think we can say pretty clearly that people have not ruled over the earth very well. We can look at the disastrous kinds of things we experience from um, really not respecting the resources that we've been given. And we can recognize that we haven't ruled over the earth very well. In fact, if you move into Genesis 3, we have the story of people then saying, uh, God, we're not going to do it your way. We actually think we can control things ourselves. We can do it ourselves. We don't actually need to follow what God says and things kind of go downhill from there. But in this story is the idea that we've been given uh, this desire to be in control, to be in charge of what's going on around us. And the expectation is that we would do it and do it well. Uh, of course, now the problem is that <clears throat> since, since the time where people began to say, uh, we can do it ourselves, we don't really need to follow God. And this is a story that's in Genesis chapter 3, and that's the one that you know about Adam and Eve. And Eve eats the fruit off the tree and gives some to Adam. And then their eyes are opened and they know the knowledge of good and evil. And that's a story that's worth exploring because it really explains a lot of the way that we think. Now, I'm going to speak to those of you who think, well, Adam and Eve, that's just a crazy story. How can that even be true? I'm not going to ask you to believe it as a literal truth, but as a story that expresses our human condition. And we're going to take this story seriously whether or not you believe it as a literal truth, but we're going to take it seriously because Jesus took it seriously. 
Jesus speaks about Adam and Eve and speaks about the lessons that we can learn from Adam and Eve. And so we're going to take the lessons of the story seriously and leave aside for another time talking about the literal, like there was really an Adam and an Eve. We'll talk about that a different time. But for right now, what the story tells us is that at some point, people decided that they could do it themselves without God. And it's been nothing but a disaster ever since. And our own ability um, to our own ability to be in control when it was untethered, when it was loosed from God's guidance, we ended up controlling things in ways that made things worse and worse and worse. And so we we have this situation where we can't control the circumstances around us, but we can't even control ourselves. Like, we're not even in charge of our own decisions. We can't even do the things we know that we should do. So in the midst of out-of-control circumstances, it becomes even more powerful and more obvious that we're not in charge even of ourselves. So we do everything we can to control the circumstances. But then we're in the midst of this quarantine over which none of us has individual control. Um, some people are just rebellious. They say, I'm not going to do it. and You can't make me. But that's not making things better for them. Most people are doing the best they can to comply with what is being recommended from people who know a lot more than us, uh, both the scientists that are exploring this stuff, the health specialists, the people who understand how these sorts of things spread, as well as the government officials who are making decisions on our behalf the best that they can. You may not agree with all of those decisions. You might not think they're all right, but they are doing the best they can to try and exert control over this. But it's not working. And we're sitting alone, doing everything we can with our shelves stocked with toilet paper and still not feeling in control. And what happens when our ability to control isn't sufficient for the circumstances? And then even our own control within our own space doesn't seem to be affecting the things we worry about the most. We get into a feeling of powerlessness or hopelessness. We start to feel a sense of despair, of doubt about is there a God or could God be in charge of this or how could God let this happen? And then with our doubt often is accompanied by a sense of guilt and a sense of self-condemnation. We start to believe like there's nothing that I can ever do. And at this point, if we get into this cycle of letting the circumstances that are out of our control control our reactions to those circumstances, people can end up in very, very depressed, very down states or conversely, very angry states. We either quit, we stop trying or we start to rage. We start to get upset. People will rage internally on themselves or the rage externally towards the people that are around them. Maybe some of you are, are starting to experience this, this cabin fever where the people that you're living with are about to drive you nuts. Well, I got a hint for you. You're driving them nuts too. Um, this is a point where we have to really self-assess. Why are we feeling the way that we're feeling? Why do we feel the need to be in control? And why do we experience this hopelessness and this sense of loss and despair when our attempts to control don't change the circumstances that we're trying to control through our choices. Well, here's what we have to do. We have to decide we're going to resist the message that out-of-control circumstances mean that the world is out of control. For people who don't have a faith in God, this can be a very difficult thing. And this is where I want to encourage those of you who are asking questions about God to really consider the possibility. Maybe God is real. Maybe there is a God in this, but maybe it's not the God who never lets any bad things happen. Um, I, I'll say this a thousand times if you spend any time with me. You'll hear me talk about this again and again. The God who never lets any bad things happen to anybody does not exist, and you have no evidence that that God does exist. You can't look at history. You can't look at the current crisis. You can't look at wars. You can't look at famine. You can't look at uh, sex trafficking. You can't look at anything and say that there's a God who never lets bad things happen. So that God doesn't exist. It's true. But is there a God who does exist, who is in the midst of this working, 
who in the midst of this is a rescuer. Because what we're really looking for right now is indeed we're looking for a rescuer, somebody to come and make this better. And the very fact that we long for it to be better is an indication that there is something of the image of God in us. In a scientific worldview alone, what's happening right now is not morally wrong. It's just a product of what happens. And actually, in a strictly scientific viewpoint, a strictly evolutionary survival of the fittest, absolutely no moral framework at all for any of this, in that framework, this is actually healthy because it's weeding out the weaker parts of our culture. It's getting rid of the old people so that resources can be better allocated for, for the, the, uh, the healthy and the young and those who can reproduce. The problem is that very few of us want to live in a world that operates from that morality. We're actually longing for something better where individuals are respected even if they're weak. And most of us want that even if we're not sure where it comes from. I want to encourage you that that longing for things to be better, not just for you, but for everybody that you care about, including those who are weak and who are health compromised and those who live in other parts of the world, that that longing is actually evidence of the image of God within you. And that the story of God and the restoration that comes through the sacrifice of Jesus is actually the story that you're looking for that can help you work this out. Because we really are looking for a rescuer. So. Let me give you a couple things to think about in terms of, of God, or in terms of being made in the image of God and the longing for something that's missing in you that was missing long before the COVID crisis. At various points in your life when you knew that you weren't even in control of yourself, when you struggled to understand why you made decisions you made and wished that there was some way to control yourself, where you joined Paul and saying, what a wretched man I am. Who will save me? Who will rescue me from this body of death? When you, when you had those kinds of feelings, that that rescuer existed. And so let me, let me just give you, first of all, a scripture that says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And you're going to find that in Hebrews 13. It's a book in the, in, towards the back of your Bible, and you can look that up. I think it's 6 or 7. Hebrews 13, verse 6 or 7, or maybe it's 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if this is true, if there is a God, and many people are searching for God right now, please imagine this, that God is not up in heaven somewhere on some mysterious throne wringing his hands about COVID and saying, oh, I never saw this coming. I never knew this would happen. Gee, I sure hope those scientists figure something out because I can't do anything about this. That God doesn't exist either. God is not up wringing his hands. Jesus is, not, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Jesus is in the job of rescuing Many people will say that they came to the deepest understanding of their faith in their deepest crises. And that's where we find ourselves today. We're not in control of the circumstances, but the honest thing is we're not even in control of ourselves. So we need a rescuer to come and rescue us from this body of death, both the disease that's covering our whole world and the body of death that exists within ourselves. We need a comforter to come and be a part of our spirit to help us manage these times. And in the meantime, we need to recognize that while we can't be in control of all the circumstances, we are called to be in control. And so we need to assert this image of God within us in our own homes to be in control of the things we can be in control of. Because if we fall into despair, into hopelessness, into, into powerlessness, very quickly we can stop controlling the things that we could control, which can then lead us to feel powerless even in circumstances that we could control once this whole thing um, gets sort of back to normal. So among the things we need to do, we need to take care of ourselves physically. We need to eat well. We need to sleep well. We need to drink lots of water. Does that seem really trivial? It's not. We need to take care of ourselves. 
We need to work really hard on the relationships that we have access to within our homes. This needs to be a time where we are building strong relationships within our family, actually getting stronger. And of course, when you live together with your family, you know, mo many of us, most of us, all of us have not spent this much time with our families in a very long time. And so maybe you're discovering um, some challenges in those relationships. We're going to take control over those things because we have been given control over the people that are in our environment and over how we react to them. We're going to learn to take control over our emotions and recognize that there's a temptation to anxiety and fear and doubt. We're going to accept those because, yes, it's a natural part of who we are as people, but we're not going to let them control the story. Instead, we're going to accept that those are real feelings, but we're going to choose a story that says there's purpose in life, there's meaning in life, and to the extent that I can, I'm going to leave, learn, live that purpose here and now in my family, in the relationships I do have access to. I'm going to reach out to others and not get stuck within myself and within my own head because we are created in the image of God. And just as God sent Jesus to be a rescuer in the midst of a of a completely broken and fractured world, we are called as representatives of the King, of the Creator God, to be, to the extent that we can, rescuers within our own families, within our workplaces if we have access to that, through social media and other internet, those that we meet, those that we can connect with. We're called to be rescuers as well. And when we do that, we join God in bringing purpose out of chaos, in bringing meaning out of hopelessness and despair, and in bringing hope in the face of really, really challenging situations. This is following Jesus. This is what we're called to. I hope that maybe somebody out there will have seen this who maybe never thought about Jesus quite in this way as a rescuer to rescue us from being out of control in our own lives. Some of you are, are um, questioning your faith right now, and perhaps you've never taken the time to just come before God, come before Jesus, and say, Jesus, I, I need you because I have no other hope, and I want to give my life to you. I encourage you to do that. I encourage you to just take a couple minutes with, with Jesus and just to say, I don't understand it completely, but there's something in me that longs for the story that tells me there's a rescuer that loves me, that died for me, and that wants me to be filled with hope and joy and love. And I want to follow you, Jesus. If that's you, I just pray that you will take the time to do that and maybe send me an email. You can find an email in the, in the notes for this video. Send me an email and let me know that that happened for you, and I would love to uh, get you connected with some people that can support you in this journey. We're called to be in control. We were made in the image of God. The circumstances around us are completely out of control. We'll control what we can control in a healthy way. We're not going to hoard to toilet paper. We're not going to hoard things to ourselves. But we're going to control our relationships with our family. We're going to reach out to others. And we're going to believe that there's hope in Jesus. Have a great day. We'll talk to you next week.